It's good to see all of you this morning. Friday night was a really special time here, as Gwen said. It was really great. Um, and then, you know, it's just been a great weekend here at Reach Church. I said in my letter that Build It Back is more than just a sermon series. It's a movement, right? This isn't just a cliche phrase that we have. We really feel in our hearts, in our church, that we're called to build it back. And that is what we're doing here. So welcome. My name's Pastor Tyler. I'm the associate pastor here. And if you're new today to this Christian thing, maybe you haven't been to church for a while, maybe you're new, it won't be long until you discover that Christians have their own lingo. You ever notice this, right? I'm not sure how or why Christian lingo ever came to be because a lot of times it's just flat out scary. I mean, have you ever thought about this? Think if you're a new person coming in to the church, okay? Here's usually how it goes. It's a, you can stay after the service for some fellowship. <laughs> what is that? I mean, you know, we say it all the time. Like, in the church I grew up, it was like, come on down to the fellowship hall. <laughs> like, what are you gonna do there to me? I'm a little concerned, okay? How about this one, you know? Welcome to our church. We really just wanna love on your family. Like, okay, kids, come on, we're out of here. That's creepy, okay? Or, or this is my ultimate favorite, right? Did our first touch team talk to you today? That's weird. Have you ever, do we think about this stuff? Or just like, you know, our growth track is starting after church. Do you want to sign up? What's a growth track? Like, are you going to stretch me on a stretcher and teach me how to grow? Like, what is this? Christian lingo is everywhere. But my favorite is Christian lingo in Christian dating. You know? These poor guys, they come up to me and they're like, she just said that, you know, it's all right. She just said that God's not really calling her to date right now. I hate to break it to you. <laughs> that just means she's not interested. <laughs> she's letting you down easy, okay? If she thought you were Fabio, I guarantee you, God would be calling her to date you right now, today, okay? Come on. Shining, sorry to burst your bubbles and hear you like, oh, that's what she meant. Oh, man. Yeah, How, but this is my favorite one, though, in Christian dating. And a lot of times guys say it. They say, you know, well, yeah, I'm, I'm pursuing her right now. You ever hear this one? Like, are, are you interested in her? Yeah, I'm, I'm just pursuing her. I'm pursuing her heart. God's just calling me to pursue her right now. I'm like, should I be happy for you or should I call the cops? <laughs> She, calm down, all right? Jeez. But I realized when I was thinking about this, I thought, you know, maybe I don't really understand the whole pursuing thing because I didn't have to pursue my wife. You know, a month or so ago, I think it was now, I think I shared the story of how Gwen and I met at like a, a, Christmas car a Christmas caroling thing at a nursing home. I think I shared that. So are you ready for part two today? Yes, yes. part two, the sequel, yeah? Here's the best, right? A few days later, okay, after we met at this Christmas caroling thing, and like I told you before, if you weren't here, listen, she was all into me, okay? There was no question about it, <laughs> all about it, all about it. <laughs> And so a few days after this, it was Christmas break, okay? We met, and then it was Christmas break. And you know, college students, you know, Christmas break is like a month long, you know? So I go home, she goes home, and I was home for probably about 30 minutes. And my phone rings. I'm like, who's, who's this? So I pick it up. Remember, those were like the flip phone days. So I... I flip my phone, and I pick up, and it's Gwen. I was like, what? She called to tell me 
that she was in the Pittsburgh airport and she just saw Dan Marino. Now I'm a big Dolphins fan, okay? So she called to tell me, hey, you want to, boo? What? Come on. It probably came from an Eagles fan over there. Huh? Wow. Hey, 72, we're still the only perfect team, okay? So chew on that one. Anyway, I'm a big Dolphins fan. So she called to tell me, I just saw Dan Marino in the airport. I was like, okay, cool. Is that, is that it? No, okay. All right. Yeah, then, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. But here's the kicker. Here's the kicker, right? She didn't have my number, okay? So she asked for it from my friend so she could call me about some made-up story about Dan Marino <laughs> in an airport. <laughs> now that's a pursuit. Can we give Gwen some applause for that move? Wow. Oh, wow. That's, now that's pursuing someone. No Christian mingle needed here, okay? That's pursuing someone right there. Just tell some story about Dan Marino in an airport and boom, husband, right there. <laughs> Unreal. <laughs> All right, now before I keep going and get into even more trouble, I am in serious trouble. You can ask her, that is the real story. Don't let her convince you otherwise. But today's message is called The Pursuit. The pursuit. This is the third message in a series called Build It Back, based out of the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Have we been liking Build It Back so far? Build It Back? All right. There's so much in these books, Ezra and Nehemiah. I wish I could get to everything, but I just can't. So today is actually the last message in the book of Ezra before we move on to Nehemiah. Now we're gonna take a couple week break because next week our Reach UD director, Wilson Forney, is gonna be giving his first ever message. That's exciting. And then the week after that, our pastor emeritus, PB, is gonna be back to give the second part of his message about heaven. And then after that, we'll resume Build It Back in Nehemiah next time, okay? But this is the last message in Ezra. But there's so much more that I want you to read. We're not even gonna get to Ezra chapters nine and 10. And those are really, really important. So within the next three weeks, read Ezra nine and 10 at some point and study it if you have some time. Now, I don't know if you've noticed or not yet, but we've been in the book of Ezra, Ezra's chapter one through six, and we actually haven't even met Ezra yet. You notice that? We haven't actually talked about Ezra. Ezra the person actually doesn't enter the book until Ezra chapter seven, okay? So today, as we re-enter the story in Ezra chapter seven, we're jumping ahead approximately 60 years after we left off last week, okay? So if you remember from last week, the house of the Lord was finished. That's what we talked about last time. And so now, in Ezra chapter seven, we actually get to meet Ezra, but this is 60 years after the house of the Lord was completed. If you see in your Bibles, Ezra 7, 1 actually starts and says, now after this, after this, 60 years later. So let's jump into Ezra chapter 7, starting in verse 8. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For on the first day of the first month, he began to go up from Babylonia. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem. For the good hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. We live to reach all people with? Good. 
good. You could say reach. It's who we are. It's what we do. But where do we actually start? Have you ever thought about this? You know, where do we start? Where do you start? How do we make this more than just something that we say? We say it at the end of every service. We talk about it all the time. But, you know, where do we actually start? What's the game plan? Should we just keep saying it and hope that it happens? You know, like maybe we just say it enough it'll actually happen. Well, look at this passage again. Where did Ezra start? I think it's easy to think that he started when he went up from Babylon to Jerusalem. Oh, that's where Ezra started. But he actually started before that. Where did Ezra start? Look at Ezra 7.10. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord. That's where everything started for Ezra. It's the starting point for our church and it's the starting point for you. Study the word of God. That's where we need to start. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Have you ever used a light to walk in the dark? You ever been outside, used a light? You use the light to give light to your next step so you can see your immediate surroundings, right? You don't use it to see a mile in front of you. You use it to see your next step. That's why the starting point is always the word of God. His word is a lamp to my feet. God wants you to be dependent on it. Every single step, your word is a lamp to my feet. His word, it doesn't say, is a floodlight to my feet. You wouldn't need it as much. He wants it to be your lamp. You need it every day. You need it to see your next step every single time. Every situation, every trial, every question, every day, start with the word of God. It's a lamp to your feet. The word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. I love this phrase. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. It's a lamp to your feet. Start with the word of God. Verses nine and 10, if you look, they have to be connected. I'll read the end of verse nine, the beginning of verse 10. For the good hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord. When you start with the word of the Lord, the good hand of God is on you. He directs your paths. But it doesn't stop there. Ezra has set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. Repeat after me. Study, study do, do, teach. teach. Study, do, teach. Study, do, teach. Study, do, teach. That's it. <laughs> That's the starting point. That's the ending point. That's everything in between. Study his word, do his word, teach his word, the end. That's it. <laughs> that will always be the most effective way to accomplish what God has called you to do. If you study his word, do his word, teach his word, you can do anything that God puts in front of you. Your word is a lamp to my feet. Study, do, teach. Look at this verse from Acts 20. Now I'm turning you over to God, our marvelous God, 
whose gracious word can make you into what he wants you to be and give you everything you could possibly need in this community of holy friends. Do you believe in the power of the word of God today? Study, do, teach. Study, do, teach. That's it. Study his word, do his word, teach his word. Now back to the story. As I shared earlier, Ezra is actually commissioned by King Artaxerxes to return to Jerusalem. You can read the letter Artaxerxes gave to Ezra in verses 12 to 26. And in the letter, he makes three distinct decrees, okay? The first one is, he decrees that anyone who wishes may go back to Jerusalem with Ezra. That's important later on. Number two, he decrees that the treasurers of the province would give Ezra whatever he needs for the worship of God. Don't ever discount what God can do. Look at that. He says, no, the treasures of the province are going to give you whatever you need. This is King Artaxerxes of Persia. And he's saying, give that man whatever he needs to rebuild the temple of God. Don't you ever doubt what God can do in any situation. And number three is that Ezra would appoint judges and enforce the law. So after we read this letter, Ezra responds to the letter in verse 27. And he says, blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers, who put such a thing as this into the heart of the king to beautify the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem and who extended to me his steadfast love before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty officers. Now, in verse 28, if you see that phrase, steadfast love, here's what's really neat. If you do some transition, you know, gymnastics or whatever you want to call it, go back to the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word, it's the same word that means covenant loyalty, okay? Ezra uses the same word in Ezra chapter nine. He says, for we are slaves, yet our God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but has extended to us his steadfast love before the kings of Persia to grant us some reviving to set up the house of our God to repair its ruins and to give us protection in Judea and Jerusalem. Ezra was able to see God's steadfast love, his covenant loyalty throughout his life. Can you see it in yours? Can you see God's steadfast love and his covenant loyalty? If not, let me help you out a little bit. Covenant loyalty, okay? We're gonna get a little theological, okay? Is that okay? We're gonna delve in here, okay? Covenant loyalty is founded on God's promise that we shall be his people and he shall be our God. You probably heard that phrase before. God spoke it to Abraham all the way back in Genesis chapter 17. He spoke it to Moses again in Exodus chapter six. He spoke it throughout all the Old Testament to the prophets. And then even at the end, he speaks it in Revelation chapter 21. Look, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. The Bible is one unfolding story of how this promise comes to pass. In Revelation, what we just read, that is the fulfillment of God's covenant loyalty towards us. He does not leave us, he does not forsake us, but he promises we shall be his people and he shall be our God. And all throughout scripture, God makes covenants with others to fulfill this promise. Our God is a God of covenants. 
He enters into covenants with different people in order to bring this promise to pass. And even though, listen, even though there are different covenants with different people throughout different times, it's the same overarching covenant. We call it the covenant of grace. Historically, the covenant of grace has looked different throughout history. You can read in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, how things have changed and are different. But listen, the essence is always the same. God saves sinners by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's what the Bible's about. It's one story. He does that so we shall be his people and he shall be our God. With me so far? All right. Now, one element of the covenant of grace, one of these covenants that God made was with David, okay? The promise that the Messiah, the promise that Jesus would come from the line of David. If you're a kid and you sang that weird song at Christmas time, oh, come thou root of Jesse's tree. You know, remember that one? Yeah, you're like, what's Jesse's tree? Have you, like, poor, poor kids, like, what's Jesse's tree? This is what it means, okay? Jesus comes from the line of David, okay? And his kingdom will be established forever. That's the covenant God made with David. For us to be saved by Christ alone, there has to be a Christ. (laughs) He's got to come from somewhere. He comes from the line of David. That's God's promise to him. You can read about this covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Look, he shall build a house for my name. We talked about that last week. Build a house, the temple for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, here's what's important. The line of David is important because it shows God's covenant loyalty. When you see the line of David, you can see God's covenant loyalty towards us. It's part of the covenant of grace. Look at Psalm 89. It explains it really well. If his sons forsake my law and do not follow my statutes, if they violate my decrees and fail to keep my commands, I will punish their sin with the rod, their iniquity with flogging, but I will not take my love from him, nor will I ever betray my faithfulness. Look, I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have uttered. Once for all, I have sworn by my holiness, look, and I will not lie to David that his line will continue forever and his throne endure before me like the sun. It will be established forever like the moon, the faithful witness in the sky. The line of David is important because it shows God's covenant loyalty. If he would have forsaken David, He would have forsaken us. It's important. It shows God's covenant loyalty. Now, let's get back to Ezra chapter 7 and a little bit into Ezra chapter 8. And who extended to me his steadfast love, his covenant loyalty before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty officers, I took courage for the hand of the Lord my God was on me. And I gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. These are the family heads and those registered with them who came up with me from Babylon during the reign of King Artaxerxes. Of the descendants, oh boy, here we go. Phinehas, Gershom, of the descendants of Ithamar, Daniel, of the descendants of David, Hattush. And then it just continues. Have you ever heard of (laughs) Hattish? No? (laughs) What do you mean? We sang about him in Sunday school, you know? 
We, remember that Father Abraham dance? There, there's no dance about Hattush, okay? <laughs> You've probably never heard of Hattush. But here's the point. Look, Hattush was there. He was a descendant of David. Hattish was there. The line of David is important because it shows God's covenant loyalty. And buried in a list of names in Ezra chapter 8, we find a reminder that God is always faithful. Here are these people, they're in exile. They're in the middle, they're probably doubting. Did God just forsake us? No. Hattish, he's still there. He's still there. In your life, even when it's dark, even when you think God left you, even when you feel like you're in exile and God turned his back on you, even when you can't see it, Hattish is there. He's there. You might have to dig a little bit to find it. You might have to look for it a little harder. But I promise you, if you look hard enough, you can find him. He does not leave you. He does not forsake you. Hattish is still there. He's not even mentioned. It's not even expanded upon in scripture. He just lists the name. But he's still there. God's covenant, his steadfast love towards you never ceases. It's always there. God is still faithful. So when you feel abandoned, when you're doubting, when you think he turned his back on you, you might have to look a little harder, but he's still there, still faithful. Ezra was able to see God's steadfast love, his covenant loyalty throughout his life. Can you? Maybe you've come out of a season when you thought that God turned his back on you, when you thought he has forsaken you. And maybe, I know I've been the same way, you can look back on that season and say, Oh, that's where he was. He didn't leave me. His grace was still good to me. Sometimes you have to look a little harder to see it, but you can't see it. He is faithful. Hattish is there. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love, in covenant loyalty to all who call upon you. Maybe I should have called this message, Hattish is there. <laughs> that doesn't have as good of a ring to it. Maybe put that on the sign. Like, where's Hattish? Hattish is there? What? I bet you didn't come to church this morning expecting to hear about Hattish. <laughs> but he's there. He's still there. God is ever faithful. After this list of names, we get to verse 15. I gather them to the river that runs to Ahava. This sounds like a hotel. I don't even know if that's how you say it. I've <laughs> and there we camped three days. As I reviewed the people and the priests, I found there none of the sons of Levi. Ah. Now the sons of Levi, called the Levites, they had specific roles. They were charged with ministering to the priests and keeping watch over the temple. They were needed to help the temple function properly, okay? But as Ezra begins his journey back to Jerusalem, he looks around and there are no Levites to be found. Are you nowhere to be found? As we claim to walk with Jesus, to follow him, oh, I follow Jesus. Can we really say that we're always available? Oh, I pick up my cross daily and follow him. Oh yeah, you always follow him like you should. You're always faithful. 
you're always there. Okay, sure. I think a lot of times, if we're honest with ourselves, we're nowhere to be found. (laughs) Nowhere to be found. Now, you won't see this verse on any selfies, okay? (laughs) Jeremiah 29, 11, God has plans for me, right? (laughs) You won't see this verse on any selfies. But if you want to pick a real life verse to describe your faith, Mark 14, 50 does the trick. Now, don't rush out and get a tattoo, okay? Mark 14, 50, yeah. You might want to know what it says first. But this verse really actually describes a lot of us in our faith. Look at it. Here you go. (laughs) And they all left Jesus and fled. (laughs) Yeah. That's what a lot of our faith is defined by, isn't it? And they all left him and fled. Yeah, try that out on your Instagram story for a little bit, okay? (laughs) They all left him and fled. Are you nowhere to be found? Are you nowhere to be found? As I was studying these couple chapters, I found a weird discrepancy between Ezra 8.15 and Ezra 7.7, okay? Ezra 8.15, we already read it, we just did. It says, I found there none of the sons of Levi, okay? But look at what Ezra 7.7 says. Look, it says, and there went up also to Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. Okay, so seven comes before eight, just to make that clear. This is before this. Some of the people of Israel and some of the priests and Levites, the singers and gatekeepers and the temple servants, they went also to Jerusalem. I thought there were nowhere to be found. What are they doing there in Ezra 7? Why does it say that the Levites went up to Jerusalem in Ezra chapter 7, but then there's no Levites to be found in Ezra chapter 8? Listen to this quote I found in a commentary on Ezra 7, 7. Look, this is so good. The Levites did not go at that time, but are mentioned here by anticipation. By anticipation. You might be nowhere to be found, but we serve a God who will always find you, and bring you back to where you're supposed to be. Even when you're nowhere to be found in Ezra chapter 8, you're already accounted for in Ezra chapter 7. He's going to bring you back. And this is the will of him who sent me, John chapter 6, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. You might be lost, but he doesn't lose you. Are you thankful that we serve a God that even when you're nowhere to be found, he always finds you? and brings you back to where you're supposed to be. Even when you're nowhere to be found in Ezra chapter eight, you're already anticipated that you're there in Ezra chapter seven. When Ezra finds no Levites, they're nowhere to be found. You wanna know what he does? He sends for them. He says, go get those Levites. They're supposed to be here. Ezra 8, 18. And by the good hand of our God on us, they brought us a man of discretion of the sons of Mali, the son of Levi, son of Israel, namely Sherebiah with his sons and kinsmen, and Hashabiah. Sherebiah and Hashabiah were ones who originally didn't show up. 
they were nowhere to be found. But Ezra sought after those Levites. They're supposed to be here. He didn't give up on them. He put a search party together to go find them and to bring them back. Or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. And when she's found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me for I have found the coin that I had lost. You might be nowhere to be found, but we serve a God who will always bring you back to where you're supposed to be. And that's called the pursuit. Even when you're nowhere to be found in Ezra chapter eight, you're already accounted for in Ezra chapter seven. He will find you. He will bring you back to where you're supposed to be. He will never lose you, never. If we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. It's not great is my faithfulness. It's great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Ezra finds the Levites nowhere to be found. Sherebiah and Hashabiah were nowhere to be found. But their story isn't over yet. Look at verse 24. Then I set apart 12 of the leading priests, here they are, Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and 10 of their kinsmen with them. And I weighed out to them the silver and the gold and the vessels, the offering for the house of our God that the king and his counselors and his lords and all Israel were present had offered. I weighed out into their hand 650 talents of silver and silver vessels worth 200 talents and 100 talents of gold, 20 bowls of gold worth a thousand derricks and two vessels of fine bright bronze as precious as gold. And I said to them, you are holy to the Lord. These were the same men who were nowhere to be found but now they have the honor of holding the riches of God. You are holy unto the Lord. See, when our God finds you, he doesn't lecture you. He doesn't trap you with guilt. When our God finds you and brings you back, he gives you his riches. And you know what he says? He says, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and let's celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost, but now he is found. Here are my riches. You are holy unto the Lord. We sing this song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost but it really should say, I'm constantly getting lost. But then the next phrase is, but I am constantly found. That's the pursuit. 
Reef Church, his goodness is always running after you. It chases you down until you are found. Come on, let's stand and let's praise him for what he's done.